break in on that and right there you know you're not here uh, we're not here just to play church this morning and if you come to think boy we're just going to have a nice little religious time and everybody's going to be real stiff and you know exactly what's going to happen you're in the wrong pew uh, you're you're looking at a bunch of old ex sinners up here and if you knew if you knew what God had done for some of these people up here y'all be sh swinging from one chandelier to the other doing flips. Amen. I'm talking about people in this church has lived a life on drugs, hooked on alcohol, every kind of sin you can think of, been delivered. There ain't but one thing can do that. That's the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. He's real this morning. If he hadn't have died on the cross, we'd just be wasting our time up here today. Be a waste of time. But I'm glad, I don't know about you, Eighteen years as a sinner, I rode up and down these roads in McDowell County. And a lot of you probably remember me before I got saved, and I was wicked. But I'm glad everything I've done is under the blood. And when the Lord looks at me this morning, He don't remember my sins. They've all been washed away. And if that's happened to you, that you've got a right to rejoice. The Bible says rejoice because your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You pray for the choirs. They sing this second verse. Let's all stand as the choir comes down, please. Bible this morning, I'm not going to ask you to turn to a scripture yet. I'm going to be bringing a, a message where I'll be asking you to turn to uh, two or three scriptures, three of them, matter of fact. And real brief this morning, I want you to listen, pay very, very close attention. All these songs that they've been singing this morning, uh, just let me know I was on track, on target. I believe I've got just what the Lord wants us to have. I don't know if I got all of it or not, but I believe I'm on the right track. I want to preach to you a message on an unusual subject this morning. Maybe you've never heard a message on, I know you've heard about what I'm going to talk about, but on the, the thought, the subject. I want to preach to you on the subject, three men, three trees. Three men and three trees. I want to show you in the Bible this morning, three men and three trees, each one of them with Scripture for them, 
hoping God will use it to speak to our heart. Let's bow our heads while we pray. Our Father in heaven, as we bow before you this morning, Lord, I'm thankful and I'm glad to be here. Lord, I'm glad you let me be here. Lord, I'm glad you let these come, and I'm glad you're here. And I'm thankful this morning for the blood that stained the old rugged cross. Our Father, this morning, help us never, ever, ever to take it for granted what you done for us one day when you saved our soul. Our Lord, this morning we pray that you'd forgive us of all of our sins, every idle word, every thought, every intention, every action, every deed, every desire, anything about us that's wrong or sinful, we pray in Jesus' name that you'd forgive us right now. Thank you for all these that are here. You know the need, Lord. I don't. I pray you'd save souls, change lives, touch hearts, and dear God, move on people today. And whatever and however you do for us, we'll praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. I want to show you three men and three trees in the Bible this morning. As I said, I'll be brief, so you pay close attention and look at these. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. The first man I want to show you is a man behind a tree. A man behind a tree. As when I said Genesis 3, most of you realized who I was talking about. I was talking about the first man on this earth. We see him as a man behind a tree. In Genesis chapter 3, the Bible tells us the story of how the devil came to Adam and Eve here and tempted them, and they sinned. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, they realized that they were naked. And the Bible said there in verse number 7 of Genesis chapter 3, the Bible said, "...and the eyes of them both were opened." And they knew that they were naked. And uh, somebody said that they eat the apple and it made them realize their nakedness. And I said, well, amen, boy, if if that'll work, we ought to pass apples. But anyway, uh, they eat it and they realize what shape they were in. Their condition was naked before God and they began to be ashamed. And the Bible said in verse 7 that they sowed fig leaves off a fig tree together and made themselves aprons. And the Bible said here that Adam, since he had sinned against God, hid from God behind a tree. Now Adam had disobeyed the Lord. I don't know, I, I, I've told you this story over and over and over again, but that's what got this world in the mess that it's in this morning, is when Adam and Eve sinned, back down in the Garden of Eden, and sin got into the human race. I, I know the uh, people who like ERA and that type of thing hate that story, and they wish it wasn't in there, simply because Eve, bless her heart, uh, couldn't keep her mouth shut long enough to keep the fruit out. And somebody said that God made Adam and Eve, and you know that's what He did. And that's not my fault. I didn't write the Bible. I'm just here to preach it. And so Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and had an absolute perfect atmosphere and environment. As a matter of fact, anything Adam and Eve wanted, they had at their fingertips. Boy, the Lord made Adam there out of the dust of the earth. Somebody said that the reason why he made Adam first is so uh, he didn't want nobody to tell him how to make, make him. And so he made him first and then created Eve second. But anyway, uh, some of y'all didn't smile there. I must, you must be, uh, hanging, you must be hanging out with bad company or something. You've been that, that bad company you in trouble every time. And anyway, uh, the Lord made Adam, and he got him going there, and he said, lay down and take a nap. And he took a nap, and he took the, the real bow and formed his wife and gave it to them. And Adam and Eve had a perfect environment there in the Garden of Eden. And so he was laying down on a bed at night of lilacs and lilies. And boy, had the heard the water going down through there from the water of life. And he could just go pick up big old fruit, didn't have gnats in them and worms and, and rotten spots. And he could just go just uh, put his mouth in one of them things, just bury his face in a great big old grape. 
or something like that. I believe they're just juicy when they come out, you know. Probably didn't even have to get ripe. I don't know. And boy, they're just hanging there all over them vines. He could do anything he wanted to do. It was just like perfect ecstasy all the time. Adam and Eve, flat, had it made, to say the least. Now, by the way, do you, I went in a big hotel down there in Atlanta one time, and they say it's the tallest hotel in the world. That great big peach tree plaza, big round one, stands up right in the middle of town. We went up in that thing, and we started walking in there, and man, there's great big old rooms about the size of this. And there's, there's green red, like this, everywhere. Just green plants sticking up. And there was water squirting up in the air. And it had different colors of spotlights on it, you know. And there were these big shots sitting around. A bunch of old adulterers and stuff, you know. Running around on their wives. And they're sitting around there in big evening gowns. And, and cocktails. Man, they was dressed fit to kill. They were sitting all around that place. And the, the water was a-flowing. And it, and, and it looked like a giant... A uh, humongous garden. And I was noticing that, and I went up another stair, and there they were again, just great big vines hanging everywhere, and water going all over the place, and rocks, and, and it looked again like a great big garden. I went up, and I went up, and I went up, and boy, you know, this, uh, the dancing was going, the music was playing, and you know what I began to notice? I begin to notice that everybody in Hollywood and everyone, uh, all rock and roll singers and all country singers and all, they try to build a great big mansion and try to make the environment that Adam and Eve had back in the Garden of Eden. They say, well, what we'll do, we'll put a bunch of green in here. We won't have any, but we'll put up these little purple lights that burns up mosquitoes and, and we'll just burn everything up and we'll have all kinds of nice exotic foods and we'll run around naked and we'll join nudist colony. They are trying to enjoy what Adam and Eve had before sin came into the world. But you can't do it. It don't work nowadays. You end up getting raped and somebody beats somebody's head in and wars start and blood shed and you get snake bit and get old and have wrinkles and they put you to bed with a shovel finally at the end of the road. But I tell you, brother, Adam and Eve had it made and if they hadn't have messed up, they would have still been in that same environment today. Well, Adam and Eve uh, were down there and one day they had a friendly visitor and this friendly visitor just came by and began a nice friendly conversation. And he said, uh, hello Eve. And Eve began to look at the fruit there. And he said, now Eve, I I've come to talk to you about your old-timey, outdated, uh, pagan religious views. He said, Sister, you need a new set of standards. You've been bound up by these old moral inhibitions so many years. I, I won't liberate you, honey. I, you, ain't you tired of doing what God says for you to do all the time? How about taking a bite of this fruit? And she says, Oh, no, we ain't supposed to eat that fruit. God said for us not to eat it. Ain't that right, Adam? That's right, hon. And she, he said, No way. I ain't, we ain't supposed to eat it. And the devil says, Ah, oh, come on. One little bite ain't going to hurt you. Just go ahead. God knows that you'll be better off if you eat of that fruit. That's what the devil does to everybody. He tries to tell you you'll be better off by disobeying God. He tries to make you think you can uh, go against the Word of God and be happy. He tries to make you think you can disobey God and still enjoy yourself. It's not true. And so you know the sad story of how Eve took the fruit and brother, she did eat and that old, the fruit of that vine got all over her lips, and she gave to her husband, and he did eat, and sin came into the human race. Now, Adam and Eve had been used to having sweet fellowship with God all down through uh, ever how long they'd been there at that time, but suddenly that day they did not want to see God. Suddenly that day they didn't want to go to church. And you know the reason they didn't want to go to church? The same reason a lot of people men don't want to go to church. They're ashamed. They know that God will turn His spotlight on them when they walk in the church door. And so they say, if God's there, I don't want to be anywhere around. And the Bible said that the voice of God came in the cool of the day. And here come the Lord. And He's walking down through the garden. And He said, Adam, where art thou? And Adam said, Oh, my Lord, here comes God. What are we going to do, honey? And she said, 
I, I don't know. I don't want to talk to him today. I, I feel dirty and I feel ashamed and I feel rotten and stinking. They, there's something between us and God. And they said, all right, here. And they went over here to a tree. And they got them some leaves off the tree and, and made them some kind of little old uh, Hawaiian belly dancer outfit and put it on there. And they said, well, maybe this will happen. He was hiding behind that tree. And boy, the Lord come down through there looking for Adam and he hid behind a tree. His condition was shameful. Did you know this morning that all sin will get you in that shape? All sin, no matter how little it may seem, will get you to the place where you're ashamed to come to God. The devil will make sin look so easy and so tempting and so good, but then when you commit that sin, he automatically brings a barrier between you and God and you can't go to God like you once could. It breaks your fellowship, to say the least. He was trying to hide from God. But you know as well as I know, it's a waste of time. It's useless to hide, try to hide from the Lord. The Lord sees you everywhere you go. The Lord sees you in the morning. The Lord sees you in the night. The Lord sees you on the weekends. The Lord sees you at work. The Lord sees you at school. You cannot hide from God. You know, it blow your mind this morning. If I, if I could just tell you what all God knows about everybody in here. He knows everything that everybody in this room has done since last Sunday morning. He knows every move you've made. He knows every thought you've thought. He knows every place you've been. And son, you ain't hiding nothing nothing from Him. You can come in here and look real good to me. And you can be all dressed up and have your hair cone and all that stuff. And you may shake my hand and grin at me. Make me think you're the best fellow ever was. But God knows who you are. He knows where you are. And you ain't pulling nothing over His eyes. You know, MacDowell County's full of people that go to church every Sunday morning that are uh, what you call veneered. And they're, uh, they look real good on the outside, like a shiny apple. But if you just take a bite out of them, they're full of worms. And they're rotten on the inside. Yeah, man, all over this town. This morning, we probably got some old rotten apples in here today. And boy, you got the outside all shined up. And you think, boy, everything's just cool and everything's rosy and you about ready to sprout wings just any minute and fly away to heaven. But I'm here to tell you this morning, you can't hide from God. Adam tried to hide behind a tree and it didn't work. I want you to notice the second man this morning. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Secondly, this morning, I want to show you a man in a tree. Adam was a man behind a tree. Second, I want to show you a man in a tree. In Luke chapter Chapter number 19, the Bible tells us about a man in a tree. And this old boy, we'll look at him just a minute. Everybody in here, or a lot of you know his name. His name was Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus. And this old boy in Luke chapter 19, we'll notice several things about him. Notice Luke chapter 19 and verse 1. And Jesus entered in, passed through Jericho, and behold, there a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and look out, he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was, and could not for the press. That ain't talking about newspaper reporters and people, that's talking about the big crowd of people. He couldn't for the press, because he was a little stature, he was a little short guy. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And there, uh, you know, the rest of the story will not take time to read. But old Zacchaeus, brother, he was a man who had set his heart on trying to see the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a man in a tree. And there are so many people coming along, and so big of a crowd, and he is short. Have, uh, I guess, uh, have you ever been real little? And uh, been up to the Christmas parade, and the parade coming down the street, you know, and you're going like this, and going like this, and you find you a little crack to look through, and about that time, some big old giant person moves over in front of the crack, and boy, you move over here, and you say, well, there's me a little hole I can see through right between those two people's shoulders, and one of them leans over there and just shuts you out, and then that's why you see little kids climbing up on top of their daddy's shoulders, and things sitting up there on top of cars and stuff, so they can see. Now, there's a great big crowd of people. 
people looking for the Lord Jesus. And Zacchaeus, boy, he's on his tiptoes looking around trying to see him. And he noticed a sycamore tree. And he said, I'll just shimmy up this thing here, get up in these limbs here, and I'll see the Lord when he comes by. He's a man in a tree. I want you to notice three or four things about him. First thing I want you to notice is that this man had money. The Bible said he was rich. Now, if riches and money done everything people that ain't got it thinks it'll do, he wouldn't even wanted to see Jesus. He would have been perfectly happy and perfectly satisfied, but he is showing here that money don't make a man happy. Now, every one of y'all nod your head and say that's right, but you're saying that just because you're mad because you ain't got none, and you'd give your right arm to be rich. You know why? You don't believe what I'm saying. Everyone, just 90% of the people in here, I'll say, would tickle you. You'd say, man, if I could just get rich, I'd do this, and I'd do that, and I'd do the other. And I'd, but there's something about money that'll ruin a person. It's too big for you to handle. Too much money will make a low-down crook out of you. Too much money will make you start robbing God when you used to pay your tithes and be faithful. Too much money will cause you to do things you know ain't right. And too much money will keep you up worrying yourself to sleep at night. Somebody, uh, I believe it was this Biltmore fellow over here, had the big Biltmore house, owned all the, the Biltmore forest over there in Asheville and all that stuff, said uh, money never made a man happy yet. And Benjamin Franklin made this statement that instead of filling a vacuum in a human heart, it creates one. Somebody said, yeah, but money talks. It sure does. Mine talks to me every time. It says bye-bye every time I get a hold of it. And I don't hardly hear it long enough for it to say anything. But somebody said that it, the Bible does say money answereth all things. And in man's estimation, it does. But I tell you, brother, it does not bring happiness. The Bible said riches make themselves wings. That's why there's an eagle on the back of that dollar bill. It's getting ready to fly away from you and leave you and go right and right in somebody else's pocketbook and they'll get the benefits from it. But I'm here to tell you this morning, he had money, but money did not satisfy. They said that a man who sets his heart on money, you listening? A man who sets his heart on money will be disappointed whether he gets it or not. If he gets it, he'll say, well, it ain't what I thought it was. If he don't get it, he's disappointed again. If all you can think about is money, you're going to be disappointed whether you get money or whether you don't. Well, see, if you get it, you spend the first half of your life trying to get money and the last half of your life trying to keep people from getting it away from you. And you're always worried about whether somebody's going to rip you off. Somebody's going to rob you. Somebody's going to shoot you for your insurance. Somebody's going to do this. Somebody's... Matter of fact, I, I want to remind you this morning, I don't care if anyone in here is a millionaire, which I doubt if there is, but there might be, I doubt it. Uh, but if there is a millionaire in here this morning or somebody who thinks money will do anything, let me tell you what they say. They say that a man that thinks money will do anything will do anything for money. And the devil will get you at the right place at the right time and the pressure on just right and cause you to do anything he tells you to. Because the Bible still says, if you got the right Bible, the love of money is the root of all evil. Now if you've got a modern version of the Bible, that ain't in there. Wonder who wrote them Bibles. Reckon it be somebody that likes it pretty good? But if you got the right Bible, like most of you got in your life there, I hope you have, it says the lot of money is the root. What happens to churches? They begin a lot of money. What happens to preachers? The old dollar bill gets a hold of them. And brother changes their life. And changes them. That's what knocked the power of God out of churches all over this country. Is the love of that butt, brother. You know how come a lot of preachers quit preaching years ago? Because they think, boy, if I preach on sin, I scream, holler, and spit on people, stomp around, some of our large contributors may be offended and leave. You say, how do you feel about that? I say, fooey on the large contributors. 
We don't need any contributors, big or little, if we can't preach what the Bible says. Brother, here's a man in a tree. He is up a tree without a paddle, I guess you could call him. I heard about a fellow one time who was a millionaire. And on his deathbed, there's something about money that when you get ready to die, you try to take it. You know, that's a true saying somebody come up with a long time ago. You can't take it with you. You know how you're going to look when you die? Just like you did when you was born, except you're a little bigger. Wrinkled. Can't feed yourself. Can't control yourself. Only difference between you and when you was first born is you're a little bigger. You know your birthday suit that you came in with? That's the way you're leaving. And everybody in this room is going to die one of these days. And there's an old fellow laying there, and he had his hands. He had a, a hundred or twenty $100 bills, half in each hand. And he's squeezing it, and he's laying there dying, and he's squeezing it like that, and squeezing it, and squeezing it. He said, I've lived for it, I've lived for it, I've lived for it all these years. I've got to take it with me. And 15 seconds after he died, one of his nephews just went over and Stuck it down in his pocket. And that old boy found out money ain't going to do you a bit of good when it comes time for you to die. Zac Zacchaeus had money. He had position. Brother, he was important. He had a home. No doubt he had a nice home. No doubt he had a pretty home. You say, what's wrong with that? There ain't nothing, man. If you got a pretty one, more power to you. Hallelujah. But it still didn't give him what he needed. There's something missing on the inside. Let me, let me tell you something. If a nice house and plenty and popularity satisfied people, those movie stars and rock and roll singers wouldn't be ODing on dope, brother, and taking their life and staying high all the time. You know what they're realizing? It don't satisfy! He had a family, but what he didn't have, salvation. That's why I want to look the third man, the third tree. Adam was a man behind the tree. Zacchaeus was a man in a tree. Now I want to tell you about a man on a tree. Luke chapter 23. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God there's a man on a tree. The man was on the tree so that the man behind the tree could come out from behind the tree. The man was on the tree so that the man in the tree could come down out of the tree. Thank God his name was Jesus. And in Luke chapter 23, I want you to look quickly at verse number 32. Luke chapter 23 and verse 32. Right quickly. You know the story. In Luke 23 verse 32, And there were also other male factors led away to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Here was a man on a tree. He was a sinless man. He had committed no sin. He didn't commit the sin that Adam committed in the Garden of Eden. He hadn't committed the sin of pride that Zacchaeus had committed there in the tree in Luke chapter 19. But his name was Jesus Christ. And he came down here and lived an absolute, perfect, sinless life. And he, he came down here to redeem us from our sins so we wouldn't have to die like Zacchaeus would have died and like Adam would have died. I believe if you could talk to Adam today, he would say, thank God for the man on the tree. If Zacchaeus could speak to this congregation today, he'd say, thank God for the man on the tree. I went up in the tree to see the man on the tree. And man on the trees could see me. I, I'm a poet and don't know it. But anyway, brother, he said, uh, he said the man on the tree saw me. And I'm glad he did. And I'm saved because of what that man did for me on the cross. Here's the answer to Adam's shame and Zacchaeus' pride and curiosity. The greatest figure of human history as a mountain over top of a mountain. Christ had not came and gave His life, let that blood run down that old rugged cross, there would be absolutely no hope in the future for any of us in this room. 
Oh, what a sad shame. The preacher mentioned it a while ago in Sunday school. Oh, the people who think that some kind of religion or belonging to some kind of church. You know those people in McDowell County dumb enough today? You wouldn't believe this. Here in this town, 150 churches in McDowell County, and there's still people who are so ignorant of the Bible that when you ask them, are they a Christian? They say, yeah, I live the best I can. That has absolutely nothing to do with whether you're a Christian or not. There's only one thing that will make a man a Christian. That's putting his faith and trust in the man on the tree. Boy, I like to think about it. How he walked up that hill. Boy, they kept him up and beat him all night long. Blood, they done put a crown of thorns on his head and hit him with a reed and blood started coming down the side of his face. They beat him to a pulp by scourging and the blood. And, the ends, and, and many times when they beat a man by scourging, the, those sharp things, what they scourged them with, would cut their, the backs out and their, their insides would fall out. Right out of their bodies. And they died a lot of time before they ever made it to the cross. Boy, they treated the Lord Jesus like that. He walked up that hill. You know what they put on him? A tree. And they said, go with it. And he went up on a big old mountain shaped like a skull. It's called Calvary. The greatest event in human history was just getting ready to take place. Boy, he went up there. And I believe the Lord, the Bible said he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. I believe I don't believe he struggled a bit when they laid him down there. They laid him down there and he put out one hand like this, one hand like that. One of them great big old Roman soldiers took a big old spike, probably rusty, and put it down in his hand. And boy, one of them goes to whap. And boy, he begins to nail that thing in. And the Lord lays there and never opens his mouth one time. And through both feet. And then they raise him up like this and put him in front of all the people. You say, how come he stayed there? He could have called 10,000 angels and said, snapped his finger and said, be gone with, and put all them fellows on a cross and he could have been set free. Do you know what he'd done? He looked out into history. He looked out in the future, thank God. He looked out in the mayor in North Carolina, in a little old place called Nebo, in 1972, saw an old 18 year old boy wanting to get saved by amazing grace, and said, I'll stay here for old Danny. I'll stay here for the Lord, uh, for, uh, for I'm his Savior. I'm his only hope. And I thank God this morning that he stayed on the cross and didn't come down that I could be saved. Hallelujah! You said you have to scream? No, but I sure like to. Ain't no reason why I shouldn't. I got something to scream about. But listen, man, you think a football game something to scream about? Boy, oh, boy, little Johnny will get the ball. And here he goes, bless his heart. He's only a sophomore. And there he goes. And they'll be up there in the stands going, Go, Johnny! Go, Johnny! Go! Johnny! Go! Just making a plumb fool out of theirself. And, they, and then they talk about me being a fanatic. The truth is, there's a man on a tree one time made the holy touchdown. And he satisfied God and said, It's finished! It's all paid for! And that's why I can say thank God today for the man on the tree. You say, Well, I don't know about all that stuff. It's the only thing a little help you. There's an old boy. We've had 20 people saved in the last three weeks. God's moved among young people like you wouldn't believe. Matter of fact, don't y'all get ready. Don't you get up here and sing for the invitation. And one of them come, some of them come down to the house Wednesday night, late after church. We stayed out in my van and prayed. Old Jerry over here got saved. Old Alan got right. Stand up there, Jerry. Is that old boy right there? He got saved out there in the van Wednesday night. You know, I didn't go out there and brainwash him. I wouldn't know how to brainwash somebody if I tried. You say, what happened? The Lord blood washed him. That's right. That's the only thing that will change a person. And I said, Jerry, 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 
You, you got all your sins on your back. I said, Jerry, if you die right now, who's going to pay for them sins? He said, I reckon I will. That means I'll go to hell. I said, you don't want to go to hell, do you? He said, no, sir. I said, you... Listen, Jerry, the good news. Jesus Christ came down here when He died on the cross. He was paying for your sins. So you wouldn't have to pay for them. That's as simple as it can be. And he said, I'll take it. And brother, we bowed there and we prayed in my van and the Lord done it. He'd done the same thing for him that he'd done for me 14 years ago. And if you could see what I used to be, listen, you used to couldn't drag me in church. I hated to go to church. I thought, what in the world do they get out of that sitting there week in, week out, boring. All the preacher talks about wanting money. Bunch of hypocrites. I know some of them down there. You know, that's the idea I had of church. I wasn't even thinking about the Lord. I want you to know, friend, He makes it worth coming when you get it just right with Him. Y'all come on. Come on right quick, kids. I can talk about this all morning. Youth choir, come on right quickly. Kathy, if you'll come, I want these kids to sing for you. If you could see what God's done for some of these kids here this morning, you'd say, I want the same thing done for me. Go how she plays softly. I want them to come. I want them to sing. It's my desire to live for Jesus. I don't know how your relationship is this morning to the man on the tree. I don't know. I will tell you something. Thank God. Thank God it can be right. It can be right. Same thing can happen to you. Put all the little ones out here. The big ones on the first row. All the little ones out here. Hey Amen. It can happen to you just like it did to old Jerry over here. It can happen to you just like it did a lot of these kids at camp. Come on, man. It can happen to you just like it did me 14 years ago at Nebo Baptist Church. All y'all little ones, come on out here. Don't climb over. Come on around out here. Amen. While they sing this song, it's my desire. I want us to stand this morning. While we stand, God's speaking to your heart. There was a man in a tree. There was a man behind the tree. Thank God there's a man on a tree. And that man on the tree wants to help you this, this morning. You may be here as a visitor, and you may think, well, I don't know which way I'm going to turn next. Right here's the place where you ought to come. Right here on the altar. And put it all on the altar for Jesus. Come and Jesus can save you this morning. You come right now while they sing. Get out of your seat and come right now. Come on, come on, right now. It can be your desire to live for Jesus. The Lord wants to help you today. That's right. Come on. Thank God. Thank God. Others. Amen. Come on. Somebody else, just get out of your seat and come. There's plenty of room down here for you to pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody, you ladies, come over here and pray with these girls. Amen. Let God. Let God help you this morning. It's my desire. Amen. Come on. Some of you men, we need some men to pray here. Amen. Let's sing it louder this time. If turn it up. Sing it, boys. Yes, amen. Come on. 
Come on, right now. Amen. Come on, right now. The Lord wants to help you this morning if you're ready. Come on, let Jesus come into your heart. Hallelujah. Well, you can take the world, health and riches. I don't need a thing. It's my desire to live for Him. I tell you what I want us to do this morning. This is un- We don't usually give an invitation like this, but I just felt like that I want you to see what the man on the tree can do. All these kids you see up here this morning just been saved a couple of weeks. A lot of them you see been saved quite a while. They're taking their Bibles to school, being a witness for Jesus. They're having prayer meeting at McDowell High School every morning before, before school starts. You say, how come? Because the man on the tree. You know why this building's here? Man on a tree one time. Boy, I'll think about that all day to the man on the tree. He's on the tree so Zacchaeus can get out of the tree. He's on the tree so Adam can come out from behind the tree. I don't know what you're hiding behind this morning. Maybe it's religion. Maybe you're just too cotton-picking proud to come up here. God's going to break you down one way or the other. He'll get you sooner or later, somehow, some way. He'll get you. I praise God. Listen. Listen, this is, this is not funny business when grown men and women are hitting the altar, bawling. God's moving here this morning. I, I believe there's a bunch more people that the Lord's brought to this service this morning because He wants to straighten your life out and you're rebelling against Him. We can't make that step for you. We can't come back there and drag you to all. It wouldn't do no good if we did. You've got to make that choice yourself. There's some teenagers here. There's some young people. There's some mamas and daddies that God wants to work in your heart this morning if you won't be too stubborn to let Him. They're going to sing that one more verse. That's all we're going to sing. If God's dealing with your heart, get out of your seat. Come on down here and rededicate that life. Come on down here and get your life right with the Lord before it's too late. Amen. Come on. Come on. Just get out of your seat. Come on right now. You can leave here today knowing that it's your desire to serve Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Sing it, girls. All right, come on, come on, right quickly. Sing real loud, man. Sing it. Come on, come on, right now. Just get out of your seat. Come on, come on. Just get out of your seat. Come, come to Jesus. I don't know how many of you this morning could really look at me and say it's my desire. Reminds me of what one of the, some teacher at school asked one of the girls what her button on her dress said and it said, my heart belongs to Jesus. And she said, does your heart belong to Jesus? And he said, part of the time. I imagine that might be what a lot of people have to say if they told the truth. Does your heart belong to him part of the time? Well, let me ask you something. Who's it belong to the rest of the time? The devil? Make up your mind, friend. Make up your mind. Whose side you on? Who you going to live for? There's no doubt in my mind. There's nobody here by accident this morning. You, You wouldn't believe the miracles that's took place since this church has been here. Brother, it just amazes me. You wouldn't believe the mirror. I mean, downright mirror. Brother, I, 
I, there's no telling who you'll be able to see walk in here, and every one of them, God's brought them here. There's no accidents with God. He's brought you here for a reason this morning. Don't walk out unprepared to meet Him. We're going to pray. We thank God for these that's come and got things settled this morning. We're just going to pray and kind of unhitch and hook right back up here tonight. We'll be continuing our messages on the church, the Lord willing. Lord, don't change your mind. If He does, we'll do whatever He wants us to do. But you come praying. Come bring somebody with you tonight. The kids will be singing. We have a special group going to be singing. And I believe God is going to do a great work in our life. All right. Let's be dismissed in the word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for lives that have been changed on this altar because of the man on the tree. Hallelujah. I'm glad, Lord, you didn't come down. I'm glad you stayed there so that we could come out of our pride and out of our unbelief and come to Jesus. Now, Lord, you know everyone that's here. You know exactly why they're here. And I pray that you'd work in their life whatever needs to be done. Bring us back tonight at the appointed time. Move in Holy Ghost power. In Jesus' name, amen.